Hi, welcome to the very first episode of No BS Woodworking with me, Chuck Bender. Before we get started, I'd like to give you a little bit of insight into the show. First off, you'll notice I'm calling it a show, not an online tutorial or a class. And that basically means we're not necessarily going to follow a linear progression from beginner to advanced. You've seen the broadcast television shows, I'm sure, where you know the one guy does absolutely everything by hand and you know the other guy uses every power tool known to man in his projects. This show isn't either one of those. This show is going to explore woodworking using the same philosophy that I based my entire career on, which is a really good blend of hand tools and power tools. When I started out over 35 years ago in woodworking, I wanted to explore every aspect of the subject. And I started out doing just that. And what I found was period furniture was my one true love. But that doesn't necessarily mean that's how where we're going to limit the show. In my career, I've done a fair amount of turning, bending, inlay work, all kinds of different types of woodworking in different types of styles. I've done contemporary pieces, shaker pieces, and arts and crafts pieces. And each week, we're going to delve into a different area of woodworking and explore it as thoroughly as we can. You're probably wondering why I didn't start this episode in the shop. Well, it seemed very appropriate to me that we start this, the very first episode of this brand new show, right here in the woods. Many woodworkers have an almost tangible connection to the forest, but do we really understand the nature of our medium, you know, wood? So starting out right here in the woods gives us a chance to explore the structure of wood, what it is, how it works, and what we can do with it based on that knowledge. So what we're gonna do is take a walk right over here. If we start out with the tree, when you look at a tree, you'll see it, that it tapers towards the top. This means that it isn't exactly like a bundle of drinking straws. You'll also notice that trees aren't straight and they have lots of places where branches protrude from the main body of the tree. Come on in down here and we'll take a look. You can see I've got a small piece of a log. So if we think of that as the tree standing up this way with all those straws stood up on end, we can then take a look at it and you'll see here, you can actually see the, where this section is split off. You can see the lines that are running in here. Those are the straws just stuck together. And each year during the spring and the summer, the tree adds layers of growth, which cause or create those annual growth rings. Now, if we take that, put it back down on the ground there. There we go. And you can see here that when we split that off, that the straws try and stay intact over their length. So really what I think we need to do at this point is head back into the shop and explore this whole subject a little more. Well, here we are in the Acanthus workshop and you can see I've got my trusty little log that we had out there in the woods. And we're gonna take a few moments and get you to understand wood a little better. You know, if you really want to get better as a woodworker, it's worth a few moments to take some time, learn a little bit more about wood and how we create grain direction in those pieces. So what I've got here is just a little piece of quarter saw and white oak. This is going to make it really easy to see how those straws are lined up. If you start to look right in here, you can see that each one of these lines that you're seeing is part of the annual growth ring structure of the tree. Now we didn't go over a whole lot of that. We will at some point in the future. Just trust me on this. There's a structure to this. We're trying to figure out the direction of the straws at this point. And if you really look at these, the darker brown lines here, you can actually see that they taper off towards this edge of the board right here. In fact, this one right out here on the end, you can see is fairly wide at this, the bottom and it tapers up to next to nothing. What that means is those straws are generally oriented from this end of the board to that end of the board, but they're tapering sort of off in this diagonal direction this way. Okay. I just exaggerated that a bit. So what that's doing is that's showing us that these straws are layered upon one another 
in a very specific way that's going to create a grain direction in this board. Now, I told you out there in the woods that trees were like a bundle of straws. And to illustrate that, I have a bundle of straws. Okay? So, we're going to start taking a look at this. I want to move this out of the way so you can get a much better look. So if we've got our tree standing up there, let's move the hatchet out of the way too so we're relatively safe. I don't need the log at the moment. So if I just pull right in here close and we take a look, what we've got is this bundle of straws and the, those are like the tubes that carry the nutrients for the tree. And really, when you think about it, the straws are the strongest over their length. If I start to try and pull this apart, you can see these are actually bound together nicely. If I pull on this and take it apart there, you can see that straw wants to stay intact. In fact, it took another one with it. That it stays together over its length. Okay, I can even split those two apart. Um, it's very difficult to break the straws this way across that, that straw. And if we tried to bond them together end to end, there's just so little surface area that they wouldn't bond together. Now, like I said, a tree is actually tapering. It's getting smaller at the top than it is at the bottom. So my bundle of straws here is unlike a tree in that it is parallel as it goes up. The other thing, the other main difference is all the straws don't travel in exactly the same direction at the same time in a tree. The straws actually wiggle in and out, they twist as they go up. There's a whole lot of things happening in there that make it a non-homogeneous medium for us to work. And this all presents different challenges for us as woodworkers. One of the ways that you can really see how the, the straws move around in the tree is if we look at a bundle of straws where there is a branch coming out of the side. I mean, you can actually see right here how these straws actually curve and twist and come in down beneath that branch. And what they're doing is those, those straws are bending around and trying to support the weight of that branch. The, the branch itself is made up of straws that taper into the main body of the tree. And we can actually see that very well on our log from out there in the, in the woods. We have a little stub of a branch left here, and we can see how, see how it ripples right around here and here and there. And you can actually see where it sort of ends right in this area here. That set of straws that are coming in that used to be that branch, that's, it has all of that material, all of these straws that are running vertically on this are supporting the weight of that branch that was hanging off the side of this log. So as we start to cut through all of these straws that are, again, the general propensity for these straws is to run from end of log to end of log. You have a lot that are coming across but the bulk of them, the major vast majority of them run end to end. And as we start to work that material down, what you're gonna see is we're gonna start cutting through this to create flat surfaces when we create boards. You know, we turn this log into a nice little flat board and that's where we see those straws starting to taper from one side to another. And that's gonna give us grain direction. So what we're going to do now is throw this thing in the vise and we'll pull in real nice and close so you can see how the, the orientation of those straws affects how cutting tools actually cut this wood. Okay, you can see I've got the board standing up on edge in my vise. And the first thing we're going to do is take a knife and slice off a little bit. So if we look right here, you can actually see those lines tapering up, ending out here and dropping further into this board here. So if I take the knife and come right in here and pull across, you can see we're 
splitting off nice little pieces there. Oops, they're falling on the floor. And you can see those straws sort of stay into intact as they run down. And the way that knife was cutting through there, the thickness of the knife was actually causing the, the straws to curl and snap off. Now that's going to be important later on as we start to learn how other tools work. The next tool that we're going to try into this thing is just a, a regular old bench chisel. Okay, Really, with a bench chisel, you're getting pretty much the same sort of slicing action that you would get with a knife. And I'm going to go the opposite direction now and take a nice little curl. Not only is it wider, but you can also see that it's coming off there a little smoother as the, the thickness of the material comes across and hits the bevel on the chisel and it starts to curl those fibers up and bend them around. You can see it's not shattering as much. If we think of those straws as laying one upon another this way, if we slice in this direction from this side of the camera to this side of the camera, what you're going to see is as you slice these fibers off, they're going to be supported by the fibers underneath of them. So they're going to tend to tear out less. That's what we call that when you go the opposite direction, like I did with the knife. And what we get is that sort of splintering effect that's going on here. What's happening is you're actually separating the fibers and lifting this one up and then snapping it off before you've cut the one behind it off. Okay. Another, another way to illustrate this is with a draw knife. A really great tool to have in your shop. Helps hog out a lot of material rather rapidly. If I take that and put it right on this corner and drag it across, now you're getting that splintering effect happening really well here. You can see I'm actually headed against the grain there. And you can actually see, if I can pull that in far enough, that the fibers have actually snapped off and shattered as it was curling up around the thickness of the blade. These three tools, the knife, the chisel, and a draw knife, essentially are the basic tools that woodworkers started with millennia ago. Okay, These things, it's just essentially a sharpened edge on a piece of steel, you know, Tens of thousands of years ago, they started with sharpened rocks. But, you know, we started with start, sharpened piece of steel and we push it through the material. The whole point of this exercise is so that you can start to see what happens when we go with the grain. We get a much smoother surface. Coming against the grain, it tends to shatter and break off like it does there. Now, <clears throat> the next tool in our little arsenal here is a spoke shave. And what we've done is we've taken essentially the same thing as a, a draw knife, but we've added a sole to it that helps guide it and keep it straight. And by doing so, we've created a mouth. We have a piece of steel in front of the blade that helps the, the fibers break off sooner than they would with um, just the draw knife. So let's get that adjusted. And we're going to pass that across the edge as well. And I'm going to go with the grain here and you can see I've got that little spot right there where I was using the draw knife and it sort of splintered out. I'm going to go the other direction and see if I can remove it and smooth that whole thing up. And you can see how fine the shavings are here. So what we're doing is we're just continually refining the method by which we are splitting the wood. That's really all woodworking is, is just continually refining, milling that lumber down using various sharpened objects. When we saw a log into lumber, we take and we're using sharpened pieces of steel to pass through. We're scoring fibers and then cleaning out the waste in between those score marks. When we use a chisel or a knife, spoke shave, what we're doing is we're taking that sharpened piece of steel and we're actually trying to figure out which direction 
the grain is layered upon one itself. Remember the straws? This one on top of the other means we go in that direction. Right? If we go in the opposite direction, we're not actually putting that grain direction to use for us. We're actually working against the grain of the wood. Another illustration of how we continue to refine, how we split the wood, and that's really all we're doing. When we were out in the woods and we took the hatchet and we split that piece off and I showed you how stringy it was, and I mean you can still see, even in here, that I've got plenty of stringiness left in that. The fibers are trying to break off over their entire length. If we want to work that surface down, what we need to do is take some of these other tools in, in various stages and remove the bulk of the waste, get it closer to flat, then continue to refine how the, the fibers are split and separated from one another in order to get a flat, smooth surface that we can then use to, to join more than one board together. Um, a perfect illustration of how to do that is a hand plane. If we look at a hand plane, we've got a long sole, which helps create, you know, a plane. Sorry folks, that's, what, you know, we're woodworkers. If we were smart, we'd have other jobs. Um, it's flat, relatively speaking. And the idea is as you pass it across a board, the high spots are going to hit first and you're going to hit, you're going to end up planing those areas off in small amounts till you work your way down to the low spots. Okay? Like the spoke shave, the plane has a mouth, but unlike the spoke shave, this actually has a chip breaker that's on top that helps snap those long straws off in smaller segments, which then creates a smoother surface. So if I run this with the grain, remember again, they're, they're layered up this one on top of the next, and I pass across here, you can see I'm getting very, very fine shavings that are just whisper thin. And we're starting to level off that whole board. If I were to go the opposite direction, and I'll try it backwards and see if I can show you how to do that. And of course I'm going against the grain and I have a piece of wood that isn't tearing out. <laughs> but that's okay. The idea is we're just refining the splitting method. That's really all that chisels, hand planes, knives, and a variety of other cutting tools, that's what they do. Is they, they're designed to split those straws apart using what we know about the structure of the wood, which is that those straws are bound together stronger on their sides than they are on their ends, and that the great you know, vast majority of straws in this board are running end to end on it at a slight angle to the board because we've imposed a flat surface onto a cone shaped asymmetrical naturally occurring substance called a tree or a log. Now as we move the plane from one end of the board to the other following those layers that are on top of one another and using that knowledge that those fibers are not running in a dead straight line that they're coming off this board at an angle hopefully what that means is we can get smoother flatter surfaces that we can actually join together to keep this and another board or multiple boards together for an extended period of time so the next segment we'd actually like to take a look at how joints work. We're not going to take a look at how to cut the various joints I'm going to show you. We're just going to take a look at how they work and why. Okay, in order to join two boards together, we need to employ a lot of the information that we've already talked about 
about the structure of the boards and the trees, along with some of the information that I'm about to give you as we go over each of these joints. What we're trying to do here is look at a handful of joints that are used in furniture making. And let's face it, that's the bulk of what this entire show is about is how to make furniture. So we're going to work with primarily furniture joinery. Um, again, you only need a handful to make most pieces of furniture. And what we're going to do is, if you look here on the bench from left to right, we have the simplest joints on up to some of the more complex joints on the, on the bench. And we're going to discuss now and a couple of the things that I want you to keep in mind as we're looking at each joint is how are we actually bonding the two boards together? Is it a mechanical bond or is it a chemical bond, uh, a combination of the two? Um, what are the advantages and disadvantages based on the structure of the board and what we know about the nature of the wood itself for each of the joints? I mean, every joint has its advantages and disadvantages. The idea is we're trying to learn how to understand the material so that we can get a better joint. Again, we're not going to show you how to make these joints in this show. We're really just talking about how did over the centuries of people creating these various joints, how did they employ what they knew about the structure of the wood itself to help make a better joint? So I think what we're going to do is come in close and we're going to examine each and every joint on the table here individually so that you can really see what's going on. Okay, we're ready to discuss our first joint here. Now, this is a basic butt joint. In other words, we have two boards that are just cut off and literally they just butt into one another. Now, when we discuss the tree and how it was growing with those straws, the straws in this board and this board are both oriented from end to end or at least the vast majority of them are. So that means we've got end grain here, those, the circles on the straws, and end grain here. Our straws are, if you look closely, you can see how we've got them tapering from here down to there. They're actually running out at an angle from this corner to that corner, exaggerated. <clears throat> and what we know is the strongest bond is between the sides of the straws. So again, if I pull in my bundle of straws here, the, le the, the strongest bond is that side of the straw to the side of the straw, not the end of the straw to the end of the straw, but the side of the straw, okay? That being said, and we look at this joint, we've got end grain coming up against side grain. So we've got the, the, the holes of the straws going up against the sides of the straws there. Not necessarily the strongest joint. In fact, if we put glue on there and create a chemical bond, this would actually not be an extremely strong joint unless we had some kind of a mechanical fastener, screw a nail, something of that nature, going through this board into the other board. It might hold together for a little while being glued, but there's no guarantee. The next joint that we're going to cover, let's just move right over to a rabbit joint. And what we've done is we still have end grain here, and we've got end grain here and end grain there. But what we've done is we've actually cut a small section away of this first board exposing some side grain in here. So we're, again, we're going to have an end grain joint to a side grain joint inside of this piece. We're also going to have end grain here mating up with side grain there. Now, on the surface, that may not appear to be much different than our butt joint, but it is because what we've done is we've increased the total surface area that is being bonded together. It's still not a tremendously strong joint without some kind of glue or a mechanical fastener. Your glue will hold somewhat. It'll hold better than just a butt joint, 
but it certainly isn't going to hold over the long term because 50% of this joint is end grain, okay? So, but this is stronger than the last simply because what we've done is just increase the amount of surface area that we're going to glue or bond one board to the other. So we're still not really taking to the fullest extent advantage of what we know about the nature of wood, which is that side grain to side grain uh, bond. So if we put that one aside and pull in our third furniture joint, what we've got is a dado. So we've run essentially just a U-shaped channel right down the middle of this board, and we're going to put this other board right into it. Now again, we've got end grain on this board, side grain there, end grain on each side of the dado, and side grain on the, the board going into it. And what we've done is effectively just added a whole lot more surface area to this joint. Again, if we, jo if we glue this, it's going to hold up better than the rabbit or the butt joint simply because it just has a lot more surface area being bonded together. But we still haven't seriously taken advantage of that side grain to side grain bond. And that's what we're shooting for because we know that if we can get those things to bond together, that joint isn't going to come apart easily because you're going to have to break it the entire length of the straw as opposed to just those tiny little holes on the end of this board against the sides of those straws. So our next step, and this is a pretty rudimentary version, but this is a mortise and tenon joint. So what we've done is, literally, we cut a groove into our board. Um, a mortise usually is just a, a square hole chopped down in. But for these, this purpose, this works exactly like we want it to. And what we've done is we've got all side grain here. And then down inside the joint, all three surfaces inside the, the groove are side grain. If we look at the tenon, what we've got is end grain on the shoulder cuts, side grain on the cheek cuts, and end grain on the end of the tenon itself. Now, if you're unsure what I'm talking about when I talk about shoulders and cheek cuts, think about a tenon standing on end this way, shoulders, cheeks, shoulders, cheeks. Got it? Pretty simple stuff. But the important thing is, even though this is end grain and it's going to be made up against this side grain right here, when we glue this together, all of this side grain on both sides of that tenon are going to end up bonding with all the side grain that's inside of that groove. And what that does is gives us that side grain to side grain bond. Now, this happens to be the straws are oriented at 90 degrees to one another, but it's still going to give us that side grain to side grain bond. The final joint that we're going to look at for woodworking, uh, for furniture making actually, is the dovetail joint. The mortise and tenon stays together because of that side grain to side grain bond. What we do when we look at a, a dovetail joint is we've now angled those cuts through that board, exposing lots of side grain on the sides of the pins, but we still have a lot of end grain at the bottom of the pins. If we then look at the tails, we're cutting across and theoretically this surface right inside that angle on the dovetail is not actually side grain. It's slicing through those fibers at a slight angle. We are elongating the cut. It's got the end grain, but we're also slicing through it at such an angle that we're actually picking up a little bit of the side grain on there. The advantage of this joint over all the others is that when we put it together, we can't pull it apart in one direction because we've mechanically locked the fibers of the wood together and we're actually getting that side grain to side grain bond, although it's a little less than what we want, because the angle of the tail is mating up with this, the angle that's cut 
and exposing the side grain on the pins. So we've gone through just a handful of the basic furniture making joints here and you can see as we went through them and explained how the structure of the wood as it relates to the boards that we used to create the joints relates to how that joint goes together and how it's going to hold that together and how we've taken advantage of some of the things that we know about the structure of the wood. The idea is we want to try and increase as much of that side grain to side grain contact as we can because when we put glue on there it's going to bond that piece together for a lot longer. So when we really think about it our mortise and tenon and our dovetail tend to be our best joints for the long term of any piece of furniture that we make. I'm sure there's others out there, but these are primarily the joints we're going to use. You know, if we look at the butt joint, that's the, it's a butt joint no matter whether we're butting together two square boards or if we're actually mitering, uh, crown molding or something together, it's still just a butt joint, it's just cut on an angle. So don't let anybody kid you that it's not a butt joint because it's all end grain. Okay, the rabbit joint, essentially, what we're doing is just increasing the amount of surface area that's coming together and then on the dado we're still further increasing that total surface area that is being bonded together. Mortise and tenon, dovetail, definitely the ones to go with if you can figure out how to work them into your pieces. So just to recap the whole show, what we, were, what we looked at first was the structure of a tree and how it, the straws run from the bottom all the way to the top and they taper. They move in and out, they twist and turn, they wrap around branches and branches that don't quite actually get going. And that causes different angles of those straws as they run through the trunk of the tree. When we saw straight planks, we cut across those straws at general angles to the preponderance of the straws. So that means we have imposed a grain pattern onto that board based on the orientation of those straws. We also talked a little bit about the fact that the weakest joint we can do is end grain to end grain or end grain to side grain. The strongest is side grain to side grain. And then we explored a handful of joints that showed us exactly what we were looking for in how to bond those things together. So we've covered all of that with the, the structure of the wood and the joints and how they relate to one another. I'd like to thank you for tuning in to this, the very first episode of this woodworking adventure called No BS Woodworking. Hopefully this information starts to make sense to you and you can follow it when, you're, when you get into your shop and you start to plan out your projects. Really, this is something you've got to consider in everything you do. And all the shows that follow this show are going to relate back to this fundamental show. So that's why I'm going to make this show available not only to the subscribers of the show, but we're going to make it available to all woodworkers forever. Okay? And next week, what we're going to look at is some of the basic hand and power tools that you need in your woodworking toolkit and how they function and we're going to also make that one available to everyone as well because that information relates directly to this. We're going to show you how each of the tools functions and how we got to make them work for us using that grain structure of these boards. So if you're a journeyman or a master's subscriber to the show. On Sunday there will be a blog post that will follow up on the show and you're welcome to ask questions, help you know just expand the, the conversation on this whole topic. Um, I will be you know available to answer any questions that you have and for if you're just a, an apprentice member or worse yet if you're not a member at all time to take a look at either joining or hitting that membership registration tab and upgrading your, uh, your membership to, so you can get access to all this woodworking information. Until next week, 
Don't overcomplicate things, don't fall for any BS, and keep on woodworking. I'm Chuck Bender, and I'll see you next time in the workshop.